Shalom and welcome to Jerusalem Studio. In the 11 months since Hezbollah launched its first attacks on Israel's northern communities, the IDF was restrained in its counteroffensive, limiting it to standoff strikes, mostly from the air. The center of gravity of the multi-front war was and remains Gaza. The idea, backed by Hezbollah's declarations, was that a ceasefire with Hamas will be followed by quiet on the Lebanese front, as well as diplomacy to remove the threat from the vicinity of the Blue Line with Israel and the return of many thousands of displaced to their towns and villages. However, with persistent problems plaguing the hostage release deal, a full-scale war between Israel and the Iranian proxy in Lebanon has become a real possibility, engulfing the reluctant parties and the region with them. Joining us to discuss it all the way from Washington, D.C., is retired Brigadier General Mark Kimmett, formerly a U.S. Assistant Secretary of State for Political and Military Affairs, among a long list of other positions. It's good to see you, General. See you, Jonathan. It's a pleasure. Also joining us from elsewhere in Israel is Brigadier General in Reserve, Redik Shafir, who formerly served as an Israeli Air Force commander, as well as a fighter pilot, along uh, with, uh, again, a long list of other positions as well. It's good to see you as well, General. With me here in the studio is TV7's editor-at-large, Mr. Amir Oren. Amir, set the stage for us. So it was exactly 11 months ago, on October 11th, uh, 2023, four days after the Hezbollah onslaught and massacre, three days after, I'm sorry, four days after the Hamas onslaught and massacre, three days after Hezbollah joined the fight unprovoked, that uh, Defense Minister Gallant and Chief of Staff Halevi came to the um, emergency war cabinet with a proposal of uh, hitting Hezbollah hard, first, and uh, with a lot of uh, power and surprise. Um, they were prevailed upon by other members of the cabinet, including the new members, uh, former generals Gantz and Eisenkot. And uh, during these 11 months, we have seen a war of attrition in the north with no movement on the ground. There are minor achievements, uh, Israel taking out uh, various uh, senior uh, officers of Hezbollah, including its uh, chief of staff or military chief, uh, Fuad Shukr, and only the other day, uh, another Radwan officer, the commando uh, branch or unit of uh, Hezbollah. But the upshot is that uh, so many thousands of Israelis are away from their homes. These homes uh, have been destroyed by persistent attacks by Hezbollah, and the Israeli civilian population is frustrated and demanding that one way or the other, the situation uh, must be changed. So uh, even though the um, <coughs> Israeli authorities would rather finish the war in Gaza first, they are under such a lot of pressure that eventually, maybe not tomorrow or next week, eventually they would have no real choice but to launch a ground maneuver into Lebanon. And just for the sake of our viewers, just to remember that uh, at the first days of the war, uh, Israel, the government in Israel, instructed the civilians along the buffer of roughly five kilometers to the border uh, to evacuate and displace elsewhere, talking about roughly 61,000 Israelis altogether, with another estimate of between 30 to 40,000 uh, Israelis leaving just beyond that uh, buffer line uh, on their own volition, with the United Nations remarking roughly 90,000 altogether. Uh, something that, of course, is not sustainable. The economy continues to cover the costs of their but also there is everywhere. no travel and tourism to these regions. So even those who stayed um, in the proximity to the region that you are uh, specifying cannot make a living. The economic ramifications hereof are devastating. But let's turn first to uh, General Shafir. I I'd like to ask you, since on the night between Sunday and Monday, we saw uh, unidentified aircraft launching a sortie of multiple strikes against uh, a number 
of installations throughout Syria, including weapons caches, including most notably the Center for Scientific Studies and Research, uh, belonging, of course, to the Assad regime uh, in a specific location, uh, which is uh, uh, considered to be a upgrade facility of, for statistical missiles into precision-guided munitions earmarked for the Iranian proxy in Lebanon, Hezbollah, uh, something that, of course, the Damascus regime subsequently highlighted uh, as or attributed responsibility to the Israeli Air Force. What can you tell us about that, and to what degree are those ongoing activities against Iranian targets in Syria and elsewhere to try and limit Hezbollah's capacity to rearm in Lebanon effective. As we get closer to decision time to launch a campaign in southern Lebanon, uh, barring any uh, uh, diplomatic changes uh, or decisions by Hezbollah to hold their fire, um, I think Israel is evaluating that it is a time to put pressure on Hezbollah and on the Iranians in Syria as much as possible, um, thereby uh, eliminating a lot of their uh, capabilities to launch precision uh, weaponry and try and push the Iranian uh, guards that are in Syria as far back as possible with the limit that there are Russians uh, in the area and not getting too close to the Russian enclaves, uh, military installations and uh, uh, anti-aircraft missiles that the Russians are manning but uh, are not firing um, and they're for self-defense. So this is a change in magnitude and pressure on the Iranians and their proxies in order to convince them that Israel is planning a, an offensive, both from the air and the ground. Uh, I think the uh, Hezbollah were surprised by the preemptive strike of the Air Force a couple of weeks ago, uh, which were, was able to hit a lot of their uh, missiles that, that were ready to be launched uh, they were surprised by the accuracy and swiftness of uh, that preemptive strike. And so uh, the pressure is mounting as we get close to decision time. Perhaps the decision time has to do with uh, getting close to the uh, elections in the U.S. Uh, so after uh, the 5th of November, um, maybe uh, a, a change uh, will be uh, on hand. Uh, from the Israelis and the U.S. Indeed. Thank you, General Shafil. General Kimmet, uh, there are reports of right now the United States shifting its attention to Lebanon uh, in light of skepticism about whether or not Hamas would ultimately agree to make any arrangement for ceasefire in Gaza in good faith. Uh, and therefore, when we're looking at the Le Lebanese front, are you optimistic that a diplomatic solution is viable within the current climate, considering also the fact that Israel demands the implementation of UN Security Council Resolution 1701, and with little to no willingness by the Iranian proxy in Lebanon to comply to such a reality, Israel will be forced to act? Well, first of all, I think it's important to understand that there is a skepticism inside the United States, particularly among the think tanks, about the wisdom of a war with Hezbollah in southern Lebanon, and in fact, uh, the cause belli for that. Uh, as you remember, on November 3rd, the long-anticipated uh, speech of Hassan Nasrallah responding to the October 7th attack uh, was quite surprising and quite passive. Yes, there was a lot of propaganda. Yes, he uh, uh, proclaimed support for Al-Aqsa uh, attack. But at the end of the day, uh, he indicated that there was no willingness on his part uh, to respond uh, other than to provide rhetorical support. Uh, the view of that at that time was that uh, he was in a weak position militarily and also with the situation inside of Lebanon uh, at that time and even to today uh, where it's on a near economic collapse. This would not be the time to have a war 
uh, with uh, Israel. And yes, while there have been evacuations of uh, Israeli citizens from the north, uh, I'm not sure that the United States, at least among the think tank communities, would be in full support of a uh, an attack into Hezbollah, uh, into southern Lebanon, nor would they believe that the uh, cause for the war uh, came from Lebanon, but in fact was an opportunity coming from Israel. Well, uh, I think we can exclude Hudson from that, since in Hudson we are talking about this uh, quite openly, and uh, there are discussions yeah, about Hudson the necessity. Is one to of many think tanks in America. You're right. That's why I said we can exclude Hudson from there, uh, since I know the discourse within the organization, of course, as opposed to others. But, uh, Mr. Olin, we are talking, of course, about Hezbollah launching over 6,000 various projectiles since Hezbollah launched its own war of aggression against Israel, unprovoked for that matter, seeking to join in the spoils, at least from the first imagery emerging out of the atrocities committed by the Islamist Hamas in Gaza. We all remember also the pictures of Hamas in Doha, Qatar, where it, of course, was praising this as a successful operation. And now, uh, of course, the majority of those same individuals are no longer amongst the living. Nevertheless, Hezbollah is currently in the crosshairs of Israel in order to ensure not only security for the northern residents of Israel, but also a sense of security that is not necessarily the same thing how how would you classify the one versus the other? So just to uh, uh, support General Kimmich's uh, remarks, there is a different difference between um, a think tank and a tank think, which is how armor officers uh, in Israel would like uh, the military to behave, to uh, go uh, into South Lebanon with uh, heavy uh, divisions, uh, not uh, necessarily suitable for the terrain there. Now, um, it's interesting uh, to uh, look at what happened um, when Hezbollah decided to escalate, but within the same step of the ladder. The uh, um, surprise preemptive attack, uh, which you referred to, um, hit short range rockets which, and missiles, which Hezbollah had in South Lebanon and aimed at mostly hitting the Galilee and Golan areas. Not Tel Aviv, but keeping it in for 20, 30 kilometers. Plus UAVs. UAVs were intended to go to the Tel Aviv area, to the Glilot Junction, where they say that uh, several intelligence facilities um, are uh, situated. But this did not call for Israel to preempt the heavy precision-guided missiles. It seems as if Hezbollah is going through the motions and is very, very careful not to provoke Israel into the sort of attack which Israel undertook on July the 12th, 2006, the so-called Fajr night or the night of the Fajrs, which will obviously uh, escalate into a full-scale war. So there is a very delicate dance here, choreographed by Tehran, Tel Aviv, and Beirut, escalating for a while, perhaps uh, letting off steam, but being very careful not to be drawn into a war. Important point uh, made. With that being said, it's quite interesting because there is a contradicting perception here, uh, if I may call it that. Uh, on the one hand, you, you see the activities of Hezbollah, and the first thing that came to my mind is battle discipline. They're very disciplined in their modus operandi, their activities are very calculated, and indeed they are not very eager to just jump into a war utilizing their precision-guided munitions very effectively in an ongoing and determined fashion. On the other hand, you're seeing that Saeed Mohsin, namely uh, Fuad Shukr, the so-called chief of staff of uh, Hezbollah's military wing, who was the, the core strategic thinker 
of this uh, terror organization, standing on the right hand of Hassan Nasrallah in all major operational activities, also very experienced, of course, and very close to the whole group, including Qasem Soleimani, who was targeted uh, by the Trump administration back in 2019. Uh, 2020. 2020. Uh, so there is a hard time to find a replacement for this person with the two main candidates that are being right now discussed within the circles of Hezbollah, uh, reprimanded on various occasions, uh, singled out for various failures that Hezbollah has mentioned during the course of, of hostility. So it indicates that Hezbollah is not necessarily satisfied with its current position and the starting position for potential conflagration may bring about a reality in which Hezbollah will be subdued. Two unrelated remarks. First of all, our two distinguished guests, both generals, will tell you that unfortunately no one's in indispensable. For some reason, uh, people are being appointed, they serve their retours of duty, and then someone else is being appointed. Of course, not always as good, but this is how organizations uh, work. The other point is that uh, Israel could not have been so successful, as far as it is successful, without the help of CENTCOM and the U.S. intelligence community. And the most recent visit by General Kurila, the CENTCOM chief, was specifically focused on the Northern Front in Lebanon. Indeed. Well, uh, General Shafir, I'd like to hear your take on the current progress of Israeli activities since they are uh, chiefly focused on aerial uh, campaign and aerial strikes against various uh, Hezbollah targets to effectively degrade uh, strategic uh, capacity or tactical capacity of this terror organization along the blue line. Uh, are we in a certain progress of effective degradation or is this uh, being once again revitalized and revived by Hezbollah on a regular basis? Well, two things to note. One of them is uh, refers to BDA, which is battle damage assessment by Hezbollah, when they fire either their drones, uh, their, their short-range mi missiles, they don't know whether they hit the target or not because they don't have visual uh, um, representation of the hit. So they don't know whether they hit the target or missed it by maybe a couple of miles. Um, and, and this is a little bit of a needle in a haystack uh, search for them. Uh, yes, they terrorize the people in that area, uh, but they don't have any way to know what they hit. That also means that sometimes they inadvertently hit something they didn't mean to. Um, yesterday was a good example when one of the drones uh, which is probably uh, 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 electric motor driven, uh, which can't be shot with uh, heat seeking missile, hit a wall of a building, uh, but the wall stayed intact because the uh, weight of the munition carried by these drones is very small, somewhere around five kilograms. Um, so that's one thing to note that they don't know what they did. In contrast, uh, Israeli Air Force knows exactly what it hits. Everything is videotaped uh, and the battle damage assessment is easy. I'll add another thing that uh, was very noticeable uh, a couple of weeks ago. When an F-35 uh, flies in the air, its radar is so good that it can actually track um, um, uh, anything from a motorcycle to uh, a, a larger uh, vehicles. And if they carry missiles on them, not only are they visible, but also their direction, whether they're pointing north or south. This allows uh, giving the uh, exact location to either the uh, um, infrared or TV guided laser pointer of that own airplane or giving it to another airplane, F-16 or F-15, that flies in that area. 
So reaching a target that is moving out of its shelter um, is almost finite. Once it moves, um, it's probably going to be uh, taken out within a few minutes. I think this was a, a real surprise um, to Nasrallah and Hezbollah, and that's why they are, uh, uh, they've taken them back. So this kind of training, uh, which is done almost every day, with the intelligence reaching from other sources um, is actually uh, ready for uh, sparking off a campaign in the north and won't go into other uh, uh, issues. But Israel is very ready. The northern command is poised to start. And I think this is a, a note to Hezbollah and to Iran that Israel is resolute in confronting Hezbollah in the north, because there's no other way that we can get our inhabitants, so over 60,000, back home safely uh, without removing Hezbollah from the border area to at least 20, 30 kilometers. Um, and I think we'll uh, suffice with that. Thank you, General Shafil. General Kemet, I'd like you to hear your take on this. Uh, the meeting, of course, that uh, we already discussed this uh, yesterday, but uh, nonetheless, uh, the meeting between IDF Chief of General Staff, Lieutenant General Hiltzia Levy, and General Michael Carilla, Commander of CENTCOM, uh, indicated the close uh, cooperation, collaboration, uh, the, the sharing of information, and of course, the U.S. posture in the, uh, the region is yet again uh, a signal of the close alliance between the United States and Israel. Uh, to what degree is this a deterrent uh, to Hezbollah from potentially heeding a, a offer of diplomacy within a certain uh, context of reaching a ceasefire within uh, the, the, the boundaries of UN Security Council Resolution 1701? Well, look, I think it's important to recognize that uh, Mike Carilla can't come to uh, Israel and say, we've only done half the plan because we haven't got the go-ahead from Washington, D.C. to do any further planning. Uh, uh, of course, CENTCOM is doing planning for any types of options, and as I've said before, I'm sure one of the options that the planners are working on is an invasion by men from the moon. That's what planners do. But the important thing is to recognize that he is wearing a uniform and he's not a politician, nor is he an elected official uh, that has civilian control of the military. And because of that, I think if you look at the strategic context of what's happening in Washington, D.C. right now, uh, between the elections, between the campaigns, uh, Certainly, we have the capability uh, in the region to uh, conduct any defense of Israel that is necessary and more operations if that they become necessary as well. But as I said earlier, I think the political decision to go to war uh, is a little bit different than sort of our obligation to uh, defend Israel. Uh, there, there's a sense that uh, in many ways, a war in Lebanon would be a self-fulfilling prophecy if this continued uh, antagonism uh, and this tit-for-tat, as you say, who's first up on the step of the ladder of escalation, who's taken that next step, uh, isn't fully understood. And we might find ourselves in a war of miscalculation or mistake, uh, and a war, uh, I would suspect, to the American people uh, is not... Uh, worth the cost of having 60,000 IDPs inside of Israel. Indeed. With that being said, uh, Mr. Owen, are we expected to see a multi-front war emerge out of this? Something, of course, Israel has been training to contend with within the context of uh, a Iranian-led multi-sector front? Well, except for the Air Force and maybe the Navy, the Israeli uh, uh, force is uh, overstretched, has been for the, next, for the last 11 months. Uh, so many reserve units, people taken out of their regular lives. This may not be uh, the uh, optimal time to go on um, another full-scale war on another front, especially with the West Bank uh, erupting. 
But there is uh, another aspect which uh, no one, perhaps even including uh, the protagonists, knows the answer for. What is the interrelationship between Hamas and Hezbollah, not either of them and uh, their Iranian patrons, but if Hamas is now seen in the Arab and Muslim worlds as being successful in drawing Israel into a year-long war, regardless of how it ends, uh, whether Sinwar will be killed, what happens with the hostages, uh, the resistance managed to make Israel bleed. The same goes for Hezbollah, but um, in a more minor way. Can Nasrallah let Sinwar get a more prominent place in this world? Can it be sufficient for him to have a ceasefire, go to diplomacy, and let Sinwar be the real hero of the resistance? There are matters of, of pride, um, of uh, the emotional makeup of leaders. We don't know. Well, the ancient uh, Chinese philosopher Sun Tzu said, when strong appear weak and when weak appear strong, right now there's an evaluation of Hezbollah's actual strength, considering the fact that uh, some doubt was cast over uh, the overflated uh, ca capabilities and capacity of Hezbollah to wage war. Also within a broader context uh, of uh, this discussion. So uh, it raises many Questions, not a lot of answers. Nevertheless, we'll have to wait and see how the situation, which is far from over, uh, develops uh, in the near future. I'd like to immediately take this opportunity to thank General Shafir and General Kimmet for all of your insights. I'd like also to thank Mr. Owen, thank of you. course, and to thank all of you at home. Until our next edition, from here in Jerusalem. Shalom. I'm Elan Etzion, former Deputy National Security Advisor here in Israel, a diplomat, a strategist by training. I'm very happy to be at TV7 and offer my interpretation along my esteemed colleagues. The uh, strong point of TV7 is to be a reliable source of authoritative insight in an era of shallow news environment that is very difficult for viewers to trust.